In yesterday's lectures, we discussed many things which were probably quite new to many of you. Amongst other things, the clash between the two ideologies in the world, the one spearheaded by Roman Catholicism, the other one spearheaded by those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord and keep the commandments of God. Matthew 24, verse 3 and 4, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. This is a very sad text. Deception is going to be the order of the day. And the other problem is that even the elect can be deceived. So it is a very intricate web which Satan has spun upon this planet. Revelation 16.13 says, And I saw the three evil spirits that looked like frogs out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. We've dealt with that in the previous lecture. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs. And they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Demonic forces working amongst men to deceive them. And the only safeguard we have against any of this is the word of God. Matthew 24, 24, For there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So, signs and wonders are going to be an order of the day. And how can we prevent ourselves and others from being deceived? Who are the elect? Obviously those who have made the word of God their stay and their bastion. Yesterday we discussed the 2,300 day prophecy and we saw that Satan hated the beginning of the prophecy but he hates the end of the prophecy as much because the end reveals a people that will stand for Jesus Christ and his righteousness and we saw that Rome reissued the challenge. I'm pleased to hear that it's still on their website so you can pick it up yourselves if you are willing to do so. Most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that it transferred the Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath, Saturday to Sunday, and that to try to argue that that change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. If Protestantism wants to base its teaching on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. So, what is the Roman Catholic Church actually challenging? Is it challenging people or is it challenging God's Word? Yes, it's challenging God's Word. And we just happen to be caught in the middle of the battle. That's all. You will remember that the Catholic Sentinel had this article where it says people who think that the Scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. And, of course, this article on Mary Online, where the editor said, either the Catholic Church is right or the Seventh-day Adventists are right, there can be no other choice. That was an amazing statement. What a bomber. You cannot believe it. And if one chooses neither, then the whole doctrine of sola scriptura collapses. All right, so what's the argument about? The veracity of the Word of God. Now, it just happens to be that the Bible predicted that a group of people will come at the end of time and will stand on sola scriptura and will stand for the Lord as it is described in the Bible. And if you choose neither, then sola scriptura collapses. Now, how does an organization that does not rely on sola scriptura, how does it defend itself when it comes with false doctrines? What's left when you take the word away? Tradition 
And if that is not going to convince the people, what do you need? You need signs and wonders. You, may, you need events that will convince people that this is the truth. Since 1844, we've been living in the judgment time and the judgment standard, you remember that? But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed, so speak ye and so do, as they shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now, there are two laws in the world today. Two sets of laws. The one set of laws is in the Bible. The other set of laws is where? Who made those? Yes, Roman Catholicism. And that is very strange. The Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That is a question of authority. Whose authority are we going to accept? Well, obviously, if you believe in sola scriptura, you're going to follow the authority of the Bible, which is the authority of God, Jesus Christ. He has the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So here is this one group at the end of time. Testimony of Jesus, you will remember that we went through that text. It is the spirit of prophecy. We did a whole lecture on that. So the distinguishing characteristics of God's remnant church was that they keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. And the Sabbath, of course, in the commandments of God, is going to become pivotal, that there might be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them and not some other, Ezekiel 20, 12. So here is this decision. And then we looked at Revelation 14, 9, where the third angel follows and cries with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So if you start thinking like him, believing him, or just obeying him, then you are worshipping him. And then this indignation will be poured out that we spoke about. So this wine of the wrath of God will be poured out and there will be a terrible consequence to this action. Now we've dealt with this already, so I'm just briefly summing it up here before I set the stage for the two organizations, the two ideologies coming into conflict. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. That is one of their decretals. So, obviously, if you're going to believe in sola scriptura, then you will say that that is presumption. That is not biblical. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. So they say, we changed it. Sunday is our mark of authority. So Sabbath Sunday is the clash point. It's not the question of a day, as we have said. It's the authority of God that's being questioned. Either sola scriptura or the word of another system, Catholicism. The church is above the Bible. So the attack is on God and his word. We must not see this an attack as a personal attack. This is an attack on God. Who does the devil hate more than anyone else in the universe? Christ. This is an attack on Jesus Christ. Nothing other. This is his total onslaught. And this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. So let's have a look at the definition of truth. The law is truth. Psalm 119, verse 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Okay? Psalms 119, verse 151. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. 
Then the word is truth. In John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. There's the other definition. And then Jesus is the truth. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's the biblical doctrine. And <coughs> it cannot be compromised. If you believe in sola scriptura, it cannot be compromised. What's the Jesuit catechism say? The other side of the story? Or what if the Holy Scriptures command one thing and the Pope another contrary to it? The Holy Scriptures must be thrown aside. We have two sets of norms in the world. Uh, what is the Pope? He is the Vicar of Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and there is but one judgment seat belonging to God and the Pope. Well, I'm afraid this God is not my God, because my God said, I change not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and for ever. He's not going to change. And definitely he's not going to allow his vicar to throw the Holy Scriptures aside. Is he going to do that? I have my doubts. Whether we like it or not, the whole world is in one camp or in the other camp. Now, remember that the Mary is the mediatrix in Catholicism. 1854, the Pope declared Mary immaculate. 1951, Pope Pius defined and enforced the doctrine of the bodily assumption of Mary. And the doctrine basically goes that the sinner that ventures directly to Christ may come with dread and apprehension of his wrath, but let him only employ the mediation of the Virgin with her son, and she has only to show the son the breasts that gave him suck, and his wrath will immediately be appeased. That was a terrible statement that Catholicism came up with. And these are the statements by the Roman Catholic saints. He falls and is lost who has not recourse to Mary. Mary is called the gate of heaven. See, there they like this word gate. Jesus says, I am the gate. Here Mary is made the gate. Because no one can enter into that blessed kingdom without passing through her. Now, didn't Jesus say the opposite? The way to salvation is open to none otherwise than through Mary. The salvation of all depends on their being favored and protected by Mary. He who is protected by Mary will be saved. He who is not will be lost. Our salvation depends on thee. God will not save us without the intercession of Mary. The Bible says there is but one intercessor between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. Isn't that right? You see, the two ideologies are not in line with each other. Jesus is being marginalized in the world, ridiculed. The word is ridiculed. Every aspect of the word, just think of it. The scientific aspect of the word, is it ridiculed in the world today, yes or no? Absolutely. The archaeological evidence in the world, is it ridiculed in the world today? Absolutely. What about the historical aspects of the word? Are they being ridiculed? Yes. What about the salvation aspects of the world? Are they being ridiculed? Yes. Everything's being ridiculed. You're ridiculed. In fact, they're making it as hard as possible for someone to say sola scriptura and not be denigrated to the lunatic fringe. Is that right? If you say, God created in six days, pfft, the man's a nuts. Isn't that what they say? Believe me, they say it. Jesus Christ, plain and simple. Well, Mary, quite a different story. Interesting that she has all these hammers and things around her, all these Masonic symbols. But while in the most blessed virgin, the church has already reached that perfection whereby she exists without spot or wrinkle, the faithful still strive to conquer sin and increase in holiness, and so they turn their eyes to Mary. In her, the church is already all holy. This is not an ordinary source. This is the official Roman Catechism, Catholic Catechism, Article 829. Devotion to the Blessed Mary, 971, article, All generations will call me blessed. The church's devotion to the Blessed Mary is intrinsic to Christian worship. The church rightly honors the Blessed Virgin with special 
devotion from the most ancient times to the Blessed Virgin has been honored with the title of Mother of God. What are these most ancient times? Uh, if this was a Christian document, shouldn't they say, at least since the Christian era, yes or no? Oh no, this is from the most ancient times. So who are they really honoring? Isis. Isis, or Diana, or whatever you want to call her. Protection, the faithful fly in all their dangers and needs. So they go to Mary. This very special devotion differs essentially from the adoration which is given to incarnate word and equally to the Father and the Holy Spirit and greatly fosters this adoration. The liturgical feasts dedicated to the Mother of God and Mary in prayer such as the Rosary and Epitome of the whole Gospel expresses this devotion to the Virgin Mary. And this hasn't been retyped. I scanned that in from the Catechism. That's exactly what the Catechism says. In the meantime, the Mother of Jesus and the glory which she possesses in body and soul in heaven is the image and the beginning of the church. I thought the church was the body of Christ. Isn't that what the Bible says? As it is to be perfected in the world to come. Likewise, she shines forth on earth until the day of the Lord shall come, a sign of certain hope and comfort to the pilgrim people of God. There are two hopes here. So the Pope officially honors Mary in this issue. Protestants say, Mary so contrary. But what do they do? They obey the papal decrees. So who are they really obeying? Jesus Christ or their deity? Everywhere in the world the huge statues of Mary are going up. 500,000 pilgrims wait for the Madonna. How to believe in miracles. And there are Marian shrines all over the world. This one over here in Austria. And you go to it and you see all these things hanging over there. Crutches and what have you. People that supposedly have been healed by Mary. This poor Catholic man over here has just said his confession at this Marian shrine. And there it says, Maria hat geholfen. Mary has helped. And depending on how many sins he has, there are various crosses in this little church. And you pick one of these up, and then you say penance that way. So if you have committed a small sin, you'll pick up a little cross, and you'll walk once or twice around the church. If you've committed a big sin, you pick up a big one, and you walk 15 times around the church. Is that biblical? No, it's not biblical. But the Marian movement is incredibly powerful. This one over here is St. Maximilian Maria Kolbe. is the founder of the Knights of the Immaculata. And uh, their aim, this priesthood's aim, is to further the cause of Mary. Here is a fascinating story about Mary's visions that she has brought about. The woman, Eve, had a decisive role in the fall of mankind through her disobedience to God and desire to exalt herself. The woman Mary has a decisive role in the salvation of mankind through her obedience to God. Doesn't this turn the gospel upside down? Pope Paul VI in his 1967 encyclical Signum Magnum identified the Lady of Fatima as the biblical representation of the woman clothed with the sun. Okay, this is where the clash started coming in. Mary says, in a vision of Fatima, she said, I am the virgin of revelation. Now, that's the one side. The other side that we looked at said, the virgin of revelation is who? The church. The church that keeps the commandments of God and holds to the testimony of Jesus. Both can't be right. Absolutely not. Revelation 14, 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. There will be a people that will represent Jesus Christ, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. Masculine. For the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. So this organization says God is the creator. 
Catholic Church says Genesis is nonsense. It's official. The Catholic Church has officially debunked the literal interpret interpretation of the creation according to Genesis as utter nonsense. Here, Vatican Thinking Evolves. This was Time Magazine. The Pope gives his blessing to natural selection, though man's soul remains beyond science's reach. Two ideologies. The one saying, God. The other one saying, that's rubbish. What's he doing to the Word of God? He's saying the Word of God is utter nonsense. Well, Papst Johannes Paul II, und die Bibel hat doch nicht recht. And the, Bib the Bible is wrong after all. So he says in Osservatore Romana, which is the official mouthpiece of the Roman Catholic Church, that Darwinism is right and the Bible is wrong. Here is Elm Street um, Journal, this magazine, and they're having a uh, interview here with a Jesuit. Uh, Consul Magno likes to point out that creationism is a 19th century Protestant heresy. Isn't that interesting? The ancient church fathers knew better than to interpret the Bible that way. The Jesuits got their first telescope after Galileo published his extraordinary findings that Jupiter had four moons, etc., etc. So the Roman Catholic Church doesn't believe this. Here they asked him, uh, aren't you guys creationists? No, it's a 19th century Protestant heresy. Now, I want you to think. Are you all with me on this? When did Protestantism arrive? 16th century. Right or wrong? Okay. Then why is it a 19th century Protestant heresy? From when to when was the 19th century? From 1800 to 1900, right? What date sort of fits nicely in the middle there? 1844 somewhere maybe, do you think? Why should this be a 19th century Protestant heresy? This is a Jesuit speaking. They know exactly who their problem child is. It's interesting. Protestantism. Well, here you have a Protestant church. This is a Calvinistic church. Nice symbol of the sun there. Sun symbol on the window. That's still okay. Outside is this plaque over here where it has these petrified stones and it says these stones are 250 million years old and does Protestantism support officially creation or does it support evolution? You tell me. It supports evolution. Every main synod of every Protestant church in the world has officially accepted the evolution account as somehow to be incorporated in the biblical account. So here we have a problem. The Dutch Reformed Church also officially did it. Well, here I am in the biggest Protestant church in Switzerland. It's uh, the Evangelische Kirche, for those who understand German. Some nice plaques over here and some nice posters along the walls, interesting ones, and there is their creator. Now, who's that? This is Brahma breathing in and Brahma breathing out. Now, this is an amazing story. I was invited to give a series on evolution creation in Switzerland, and they happened to hire this hall just because it was a nice hall. It was just a hired hall from the Evangelische Kirche on evolution creation. And the flyers went out and everybody was invited. And then on the day before the lecture started, the pastor of this institution came to us and he asked the question. He said, well, you know, I never really thought about this, but what are you going to say? 
Are you going to say that God created or are you going to support evolution? What are you going to do? And I said, no, we're going to show that God created. And he said, well, that's it. Sorry, you cannot have the hall anymore. We're cancelling the hall. I said, well, that's very interesting, you see, because we have a contract we paid to rent your hall and we have sent thousands of flyers out that costs a lot of money and you are cancelling the hall, well, then you're going to be in trouble because then you will have to pick up all those costs and see to it that everybody who has been invited will be able to go to another venue. That's only fair if you're going to cancel the hall because of that. So they went into a huddle with much steam rising from their heads. And eventually they solved the problem. They said, okay, you can keep the hall and you can give your lectures, but before every lecture, you have to announce that the organization to whom this hall belongs, the Evangelische Kirche, officially distantiates itself from the creation account. So I said, with pleasure. <laughs> and before every lecture, I said, I would just like to tell you that the organization, the Evangelische Kirche, officially distances itself from the creation account. And I gave my lecture. And after the lectures, the people said, but why? And I said, well, you'll have to ask them that. You'll have to ask them that because there is their creator. Brahma breathes in. Brahma breathes out. Unbiblical doctrines of Rome, I've dealt with them already. Infant baptism, sprinkling, state of the dead, immortality, prayers to the dead, repetitive prayer and forgiveness of sins, hell, place and state in which the devils and such human beings as die in enmity with God suffer eternal torment, a Catholic dictionary, page 395. This is the reason why I was an atheist, because of that statement. I was an atheist. We'll have to look at that in the le next lecture. Indulgences, you can buy yourself free, the Mass, a mission of the Cup, Council of Constance, Sunday worship, Scripture, Index of Prohibited Books, Pope Paul VI the 1599, Archbishop Adolphus in 1462 broke up the printing establishment of the Gutenberg and Schäfer. So, which books are still prohibited? The Textus Recepticus is still a prohibited book. You have to accept their versions. Preterism is a Jesuit doctrine. The Antichrist was in the past. He was a little Greek insignificant king. And uh, futurism, the Antichrist will come in the future. Higher criticism, tearing the Bible apart. These are all Roman Catholic doctrines. They all emanate from Rome. 1854, Mary Immaculate. 1951, the Assumption of Mary and all the terrible statements that go along with it. Luke 11, 27, 28. And it came to pass as he spoke these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bore thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. They said to Jesus. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Why did Jesus rebuke her? Because what she was uttering was a Babylonian fable. That's what she was uttering. And Jesus said, no, the word of God and obedience, that's the criterion, not some celestial myth. Pagan priesthoods of Sibel, they were celibate, they were tonjet, that means they were cut over here like some monks still are to this very day. The commission they receive, the power of sacrificing for the living and the dead. Can you sacrifice for either of them? Hebrews 10, 14, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. In fact, there is not one biblical doctrine in the whole of the theology. So how do they solve this problem? Well, listen to what the theologian Karl Rana, he is currently the head of the Congregation of Doctrine and Faith, that means the head of the Inquisition at the moment, and he has pointed out that we are moved much more readily and effectively by those divine interventions that we call apparitions than by abstract teachings 
of knowledgeable theologians or the hierarchy of the church. Wow! Fascinating. So what moves us? Apparitions. They move us. Teachings of theologians, let's, let's forget that. So if you don't have the Bible, or you have corrupted the Bible, well then that's all you have left. That's all you have left. And so we've had amazing Marian apparitions in the world. These are the Marian apparitions that have been approved by the Catholic Church. Our Lady of Guadalupe, 1531, approved. Our Lady of Guadalupe means she who crushes the serpent. Isn't that interesting? She who crushes the serpent? Who crushes the serpent? Jesus crushes the serpent. Then this one's fascinating because I, the date is so interesting. 1846. You know, I sort of get a little bit excited when I see these dates. La Salette, France. It was approved by the church. And she said Lucifer was unleashed in 1864. It's very interesting. Or she said he will be unleashed then, more or less. Whatever. Lourdes, France, 1858. Approved. I am the Immaculate Conception. That's a blatant lie. The only one who was without sin was Jesus. No one else. The Bible says she was a woman under the law, which means she was under the same condemnation of the law as everyone else. She was sinful. But her son was not. And then Pontman, France, 1871. That's also been approved. Fatima, Portugal, 1917. It's also been approved. Mary calling herself Queen of the Rosary. And these three children, Lucia, Francesco, Jacinta. Lucia would live to see the fulfillment of all the messages. A very, very old lady. And then the Belgium apparition, 1932 to 33, approved. I am the mother of God, the queen of heaven. Pray always. Here we have Isis reinstated. Then we have Garabandal, Spain, 1961. Akita in Japan, 1973, approved by the local bishop. Majigore of the former Yugoslavia. And present, she's the queen of peace. Now, these are interesting phenomena. The Thunder of Justice, Ted and Maureen Flynn, Fatima was the most significant apparition for the early part of the 20th century. Majigore is meeting the spiritual needs of this generation. Interesting. In the latter part of the century, His Eminence, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, now you know who that is by now, has stated in the Ratzinger Report, one of the signs of our times is that the announcement of the Marian apparitions are multiplying all over the world. So if you don't have the Bible, you better have something else. 1950, the renowned Catholic churchman, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, wrote, We are living in the days of the apocalypse. The last days of our era, the two great forces of the mystical body of Christ and the mystical body of the Antichrist are beginning to draw up their battle lines for the catastrophic contest. Now, we looked at this context yesterday from our point of view, the biblical point of view. Now we're going to look at it from whose point of view? Their point of view. The Catholic. That's only fair. You can, must be able to choose, right? We have a right of choice over here. We've seen there is the biblical account of what's going to happen. The woman in white, she keeps the commandments of God. She holds to the testimony of Jesus. She's going to arrive 18, after 1844, going to be organized, and she's going to oppose everything that is happening in the world with the three angels' messages and the loud cry. We did that yesterday in great detail. Now, who does that organization that we dealt with yesterday, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who do they say is the Antichrist? Catholicism. Catholicism. Who did the Reformers say was the Antichrist? 
Catholicism. Every single one, every single one said the same thing. Why? Because they changed the word of God. Now, who do you think they will think is the Antichrist? Obviously, someone else. Beginning to draw up their battle lines for the catastrophic context. Here comes a contest. But this contest is one that we're just caught in the middle of. It's really a contest against Jesus and his word. And if I see that, well, then I'm actually appeased because I have nothing to worry about. Armageddon. I am now announcing to you that this is the time of the decisive battle. That's what Mary said. So we said the Bible teaches us by all the signs that we've discussed that we're at the end. We're at the battle line. Mary says, in adverted commas, says exactly the same thing. I'm announcing to you that this is the time of the decisive battle. Pope Leo had a vision of a confrontation between God and Satan. Pope Leo was made to understand that Satan would be allowed 100 years to attempt to try to destroy the church. In the vision, Satan chose for his 100 years the 20th century. It's interesting. He is full of furious activity, for he knows that his time is short. Now, if you know anything about occultism, who do they say Satan really is? What do the occultists say is Satan? Yahweh, Michael, Jesus is Satan. So Christ will have a shot at the Catholic Church, put it that way around, in the 20th century. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. La Salette, let's go back to there, 1846, approved. Lucifer was unleashed in 1864. There's the quote in The Thunder of Justice, Ted Maureen Flynn. By the way, Malachi Martin wrote the foreword to that book, so this is not just any old book. So, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was officially formed in 1863. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was organized in 1863 with 3,500 members, half a dozen local conferences, about 30 ministerial laborers, and a general conference committee of three. Wow, that's kind of interesting. It's just, just an interesting fact. Now, let's have a look what La Salette, France, said the issue would be. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? All right. Mary says... If my people do not wish to submit themselves, this is the La Salette apparition. If my people do not wish to submit themselves, I am forced to let go of the hand of my son. It is so heavy and weighs me down so much I can no longer keep hold of it. I have suffered all the time for the rest of you. If you do not wish my son to abandon you, I must take it upon myself to pray for this continually, and the rest of you think little of this. In vain you will pray, in vain you will act. You will never be able to make up for the troubles I have taken over for the rest of you. I gave you six days to work. I have kept the seventh for myself, and no one wishes to grant it to me. This is what weighs down the arm of my son so much. Wow. What was the issue that La Salette said would be the problem? The Sabbath. But now, which Sabbath? If you are on the Seventh-day Adventist side, which one is the Sabbath? The seventh day would be Saturday, according to the Bible. If you are on the so-called Mary's side, then which one would you propagate? Obviously, Sunday. Now, isn't it interesting that La Salette says Satan will be unleashed now and this is an issue? Would you find that interesting or coincidental or whatever? Pope Pius, in his encyclical letter of August 15, 1854, said, The absurd and erroneous doctrines or ravings in defense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilential error. A pest of all others must most to be dreaded in a state. The same Pope in his encyclical letter, December 8, 1864, 
anathematize those who assert the liberty of conscience and the religious worship, also all such as maintain that the church may not employ force. Well, who started doing that publicly in that date? Well, when was the Seventh-day Adventist Church constituted? 1864. And as a consequence of their actions, these encyclical letters were started to be written that we discussed yesterday. Catholic visionaries and predictions. That is a topic we need to discuss in some detail. So we've seen the background now. The battle lines are drawn. Two groups coming up. The one group standing for the commandments of God and the word of God and the centrality of Jesus Christ. The other group standing for signs and wonders, miracles, commandments of the church and apparitions as support because there's no biblical support. And we have to make a choice. This is the book, The Thunder of Justice, The Warning, The Miracle, The Chastisement, Ted and Maureen Flynn, foreword by Malachi Martin. Let's just read this foreword quickly. It's very interesting. The Thunder of Justice. Only a very distracted and unaware Christian of today could have avoided receiving at least a fleeting impression of the long hot summer of 1993 that for a number of years now there has been a steady build-up of events. In the broadest sense of that world, all of which indicate that humanity as a whole and the Holy Roman Catholic Church in particular have reached a fateful threshold beyond which lies a new condition of human affairs. This is interesting stuff. Well, Malachi Martel, professor, pontifical university, claims to have been an ex-Jesuit, but is of course fully Roman Catholic, there's no such thing as an ex-Jesuit, but nevertheless, who's still in there. Visions, appearances, messages, predictions, warnings, interpretations, weeping statues, bleeding icons, miraculous spring water, spontaneous cures, spinning dances of the sun, eclipses of the moon, little children telling the future, uneducated men and women instructing popes and presidents, nationwide publicity tours by bearers of special revelations. Throughout all of this, an obvious emphasis on the singular role of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Nazareth as the Queen of Heaven, Mother of all the living, and not surprisingly, as the Mediatrix of all graces, is pervasive. Very interesting. But such exultancy is soberly contrasted with the other side of this century's carnage, for this is a century that has witnessed and is still witnessing scenes of unmitigated horrors, industrial slaughter of planned wars, literally millions of men and women and children killed, the wiping out sometimes, as it were, of a night of mighty empires, an ever-widening ripple of infanticide running to well over a billion in the last 50 years, an ever-climbing number of fratricidal wars, 245 at the date of the writing, are in progress. Waves of tortures and persecutions on all five continents, continual scream of natural disasters without known parallel in human history as we know it. This world scene is overhung by a generalized economic depression and the clear emergence of an yet skeletal one-world government that is professionally secular, frighteningly dangerous for human liberty and in dim outline resembles George Orwell's portrait of a big brother in his 1984 scenario. Truth and error mixed together. So, starting in 1973, a certain Father Gobi began to write down interior locutions. That's dictated messages. God doesn't work like that. He impresses with the Spirit and the prophets wrote down with their own words. But the number are over 600 published in this book, Priests, Our Lady, Beloved Sons. And basically the message says, be faithful to the Pope, total obedience to his commands ready to fight even to the shedding of their blood in order to remain united to him and faithful to the gospel. 
Is he recognized by the Pope? Absolutely, there he is, Pope John Paul II and Father Gobi. What does he have to say? He says, September 18, 1988, that we have a period of 10 years, 10 decisive years. In this period of 10 years, they will come to a completion the time of the Great Tribulation, which has been foretold to you in the Holy Scriptures. In this period of 10 years, all the secrets which I have revealed to some of my children will come to pass. Well, September 18, 1988 to September 18, 1998 is the time period which he said. By September 1998, the papacy had every encyclical in place that it needed, including its Sunday encyclical, which came before that date, and including its ad tuendum fidum, which says heretics must be punished if they do not agree with the papal teaching. Everything was in place. In other words, the world is just waiting for the unfolding of the final events. The last dogma that will be declared is that Mary is co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and uh, that means she takes part in our salvation. One scholar remarks that the title advocate is used almost exclusively for Mary and not for the saints. It is particularly appropriate to Mary. That's interesting because the Bible says that there is one man that can save us, an advocate, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Does it say Mary there? No. So here's another biblical problem. Cardinal Ratzinger reportedly has written the visionary that there are no theological barriers to proclaiming such a dogma. So Mary is the contrary one. She is co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces, an advocate of the people of God. What a statement to make. That's demoting Jesus Christ. So all of a sudden, in this time period, a huge explosion of activity. We find many, many sightings of so-called UFOs. We find strange things happening, patterns in the field, some of them fake, some of them not explicable. We have apparitions in Eastern mysticism. We have apparitions in Western mysticism. Sri Namurti and Krishna, this was the one who was supposed to be declared the Messiah, but now Maitreya has taken his place. In Islam, you have uh, fruits and vegetables. When they're cut open, have the name of Allah in them. In Iran, it is reported in various parts of the city that an image of Jesus has been on the fences and windows. So writes the Iranian newspaper Akbar in 25 December 1995. In Saitun, Egypt, Mary apparitions hovered over the churches and Thousands and thousands of Muslims were stunned by this. Statues started bleeding. Father Anastios, a Greek Orthodox, was one of the first to see it. Then this lady over here, Hamida, a Muslim, she saw the tears running down the statues and she said, it was beautiful, so beautiful. Benjamin Cream came onto the scene with his Maitreya stories and then Maitreya started appearing. And so we have had images of Mary, and we have had light emanating from Japanese Bodhisattva images, Hindu milk miracles, Muslim miracles, hosts and hosts of miracles suddenly all over the world. And where this Maitreya appears, the water gets ripply, and uh, here in Nordenau, Germany, they're running to fetch the water to be healed. Crosses appeared in the windows, crosses that stayed there permanently, strange lights appeared on the statues of Maitreya in, in uh, Eastern temples. Interesting hand signals that they have, these people. These lights were not there. There was no candle or a light burning. It was just on the Buddhas. And then Lord Ganesha started drinking milk. And the statues in, in Hinduism, they started holding milk to them, and the milk would just go, gone. Well, I always say Lord Ganesha had better attend one of my, two of my health lectures. <laughs> and uh, here's another little statue drinking milk. And so the Hindus were feeding milk to all their statues. A little girl, Hasna, a Muslim girl, started crying real crystal tears. She was investigated by doctors, strange apparitions in the rocks of mysticism in... Uh, 
your continent, the white buffalo calves were born in 1994 and in 1996, fulfilling Native American prophecies. The odds of such an apparition estimated at 6 to 10 million to 1. All these things saying we are coming to the close of time. Vatican II, this is the door commemorating Vatican II, which had stated that uh, all churches can stay what they are provided they accept papal supremacy. And remember that Don Bosco had predicted that the gospel ship would land between the two pillars of Catholicism, the Eucharist and Mary, one year before the close of the century. So one year before the close of the century, 1999, they had the ecumenical movement where the Pope was declared the spiritual leader of the world. It went into fulfillment, whether we like it or not. Mary was ready to be made goddess. Millions of Catholics want a godly Mary and the papal dogma, Maria soll Göttin werden, well, was approved at least verbally by the Pope. Our Lady of Guadalupe, 1994, the, the icons started weeping oil and uh, strange lights started coming down in Guadalupe, which was supposedly the Shekinah glory. And many religions start worshipping Mary with all these apparitions all over the world. Mary supplants the Earth Mother in uh, Indian rituals. Guadalupe stage. This was the famous dancing of the sun that took place in Fatima. And there water gushes forth and millions and millions and millions of people go to these shrines to be healed. And they go into the water to be healed. Now this is a very strange teaching and we find it also in the Bible where at the pool of Patesta there lay a man and the theory went in their minds that when the pool was uh, moved by the angel of the Lord and somebody happened to be in the pool, then that someone would be healed. And people are saying that verse should never be in the Bible. Well, that verse must absolutely be in the Bible because the angel of the Lord swirling the water and someone by chance being in there was their mindset. This is Babylonian religion. This is Babylonian religion. But the angel of the Lord in human form was amongst them, Jesus Christ. And he went into that situation and what did he do? He went to the man lying there, all those years a cripple, and he said to him, come let me help you into the water. I am the angel of the Lord become flesh. And he carried him into the water, waited, twirled it and put him inside, right? No, that's not the biblical story at all. He rebuked their ideology, their fable belief. Because God doesn't work like this to favor this one or favor that one by a chance twirling. And if you're lucky enough to be in the water at that time, so be it. You don't have to go on a pilgrimage to be saved. No, he rebuked it. He went to the man and he said, you want to be saved? You want to be made whole? Yes. Get up, pick up your bed and walk. And it was on the Sabbath day. What a tumult Jesus caused. Taking away all of this rubbish in one miracle. Well, Mary is being honored more than Jesus, that's for sure. This is all you ever see the Pope doing. And then, when this uh, Roe versus Wade situation was here in the States with the abortion issue, France exploded this nuclear device, and in the cloud there was something like someone on the cross, and the apparition of Mary looking down upon the cross. And these are the little children of Garabandal, Spain, Loli and Jacinta, in ecstasy down here, lying in vision. Notice their eyes are closed. Isn't that interesting? All kinds of interesting things. Little children in vision. The messages warn that the people of the earth are floundering in a morass of debauchery, moral confusion, deep spiritual darkness, should heaven's directions and counsels go unheeded, the eternal Father in the Trinity will be left with no alternative 
but to forcefully recall mankind to its obligations through chastisement. There will come great turmoil upon this earth. Now, isn't it strange that the world is permitted to do everything that's wrong, abortions and this and that, and the only voice that sounds morality happens to be which one? Which is the only church out there that's loudly saying every time, no, 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 you should not do that. Rome. Rome. So all the affections move towards Rome. They don't look at their Bibles. They're looking at miracles, signs and wonders and a deceptive voice. The Vasula started receiving automatic handwriting. God doesn't work like that. He doesn't take your hand and dictate to you. That's how many of the New Age writings come into existence. Here is an um, interview with Father Laurentin, with Vassila. Uh, how do you receive the messages? It is dictated, but you said your hand moved in some way? Yes, it is simultaneously. At first he moves my hand without dictating, and then etc., etc., etc. And then Mary said, there will be a sign. In this former Yugoslavian Magyagora, Mary has been appearing and giving a messages to the world, and she says, there will be a sign given for the atheists, you faithful already have signs and you have become the sign of the atheists. So there will be some kind of permanent sign. These are the little children of Madjigora who were allowed to see the vision. December 7, 1974, Mary revealed to Father Gobi why she chooses the little ones. I, the mother of the church, am personally intervening and initiating my work of salvation. I'm initiating it thus, with simplicity, with hiddenness, and such humble manner that most people will not even be aware of it. But this, is my, this, my sons, has always been the way your mother has acted. With what? Hiddenness. That's an interesting phenomenon, hiddenness. What's the last book of the Bible called? Revelation. Those are two characters in opposition one to the other. The one is called hiddenness, the Bible calls her mystery, Babylon the Great. And the other one is Revelation. God wants you to know. Fatima, Garabandal, Madjugorje, Argentina, Jesus supposedly said, my mother must be accepted, my mother must be heard in her totality of her messages. Souls will come to me through the means of her immaculate heart. Jesus is taking a back street. Madjugorje, visionaries, there are little apparitions over there of Mary, there are other apparitions. This one over here was in Arizona. A man saw a bush with full of flowers. His wife didn't see any flowers, so he photographed it for her. And when they developed it, there were no flowers, but there was Mary of the Rosary behind the bush. Another apparition, lights appearing above churches, Madjugorje, Mary's image appearing above uh, the two Steeples of the church, light streaming from her hands, standing on the moon, that's the basic image that is always appearing. Strange flashes of light everywhere, strange apparitions in the, in the clouds, some of them very clear, like this one over here, Jesus with a crown of thorns, face appearing above these sights. Strange lights where people walk, pillars of light, this woman standing next to a pillar of light which doesn't exist. St. Francis is another one who regularly appears, roommate of Loyola, where the youth comes together at these sites. These strange lights appear in the sky, crosses appear in the sky, apparitions appear, and where they appear, the roses bloom in the middle of winter. Very strange things. Or these lights coming down from heaven, like fire, passing right through people, I don't know whether you can see this properly. There's a young couple standing over there and there's a light going like an arrow through a Bible or something they have in their hand right through. And then where they have their, their meetings, these lights appear in the sky with writing sometimes. Here like fire upon the attendees. And here you have fire and light coming down on the delegates and entering into them. Now, if you see these things, what would you imagine? These are really phenomenal things happening. 
Here are visions of writings in the sky and strange apparitions all over the place where the young people gather. Little apparitions of Mary appearing. This was a volcano and it was Madonna and Child. And this was taken out of an aeroplane, Jesus walking in the clouds. Guardian angels above children, writing, Jacinta was one of the visionaries, writing appeared in the sky in 1972. Some of these are being interpreted. Pictures like these taking, this is one of the monks of the area in his monk uh, dress, apparently riding a stairway to heaven. This is weird stuff. Here is an escalator uh, in a department store after it was closed, taken by the survey camera of Mary riding the escalators. It's such silly stuff. <laughs> but it gets worse. It gets worse. Here is Jesus in a tornado. And then the weeping statues. Blood and oil and water. This one over here is a very interesting statue. This is the one of the Philippines in 1993 of this blood pouring from the face. And uh, here you have petals, rose petals that fall from the sky. And these structures of Jesus as king, of Mary with the light streaming from her eyes, of the whole family of God, Mary again. Here is the face of Jesus. Look, there's his nose, his eyes. And Jesus with this sign, grown into the rose. Not just drawn onto the rose. And these fall from the sky in the Philippines on Marian Day. They just fall from the sky and they're very treasured. Here you have the cross and the women around the cross on a rose petal. Another one with the two women on the cross. These are rose petals that fall from the sky. Very convincing to people that do not have the Bible. The Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. Fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity. Is the devil expecting some major catastrophes? Great lights will appear. Here are some more weeping statues. This is one with oil weeping. And uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, USA, an hour after midnight prayer. Vigil began on December 1998. The miracle statue of Our Lady of Guadalupe again, began again to weep real tears. She cried again the following afternoon at 2 and 2.30 p.m. Tearful statue called the Weeping Virgin of Las Vegas. That's a good town to weep in, right? Okay. So they really know how to perform these things. Periodically, this statue starts weeping. This statue over here belongs to a lady called Julia Kim. And she is one of the present-day stigmatists of the Roman Catholic Church. Do you all know what a stigmatist is? Stigmatist is someone who bleeds by the hands or has the marks of Christ or bleeds by the feet or uh, suffers the agonies of Christ for the sins of the world. And this is one of her statues. Also this one over here, a statue of Christ, which started bleeding real blood. They've had it analyzed. The great stigmatories of the world. This one was the, one of the most famous ones of modern times. Her name was Teresa Neumann. She lived from 1898 to 1962 in Germany. They say she never ate, slept, nor drank. She had no bodily functions for 40 years. That means she never went to the toilet. And she only lived on the Eucharist. Now, if that is true, I don't know. They say so. And uh, she said great natural disasters will come in the United States. Here she is in her stigmatic agonies. Notice the blood running out of her eyes, running down from her hands. And then she would have burnt in crosses after that event. Another famous stigmatist was Padre Pio of Italy, 1887 to 1968. And he said it would be easier for the world to exist without the sun than the holy sacrifice of the mass. There he is bleeding by the hands. And here he's being helped while he's saying the mass. And in Rome itself, many of the statues with hosts started bleeding. And the hosts developed blood. 
And when they said the mass, the host itself turned into blood. This was one in 1991. Here is another one that turned to blood. Here's another one that turned into a blood clot as they said the mass. Here is a priest investigating one of the hosts. And then the most amazing thing happened. The Pope himself was saying mass and he fed the host to Julia Kim, the stigmatist. And there he is, Pope John Paul II giving mass to Julia Kim, the stigmatist, and they took the photograph as the host was on her tongue and the newspaper said, Bild Papst sah Hostia bluten. Pope saw the host bleed. There's the picture. It turned into a clot of blood in her mouth. That's pretty dramatic. And the question is, is this from God or is this from another source? It's pretty dramatic. If you were a Roman Catholic and you saw this happening and this was what religion was all about, well, it would be convincing. Here is uh, Virginia. She's a stigmatist. This priest is also a stigmatist. She lives in Ireland, this young woman over here. And she suffers terribly. There her feet are bleeding and her hands are bleeding. She also gets uh, the same things on her head. So Julia Kim is a, a present-day stigmatist and uh, Christina Gallagher is another present-day stigmatist. Here, Julia Kim is blessed by the Pope. Here is, she receives a medal from the Pope. She's also a visionary, so she has these visions for the Roman Catholic Church. Here she is with the papal nuncio, Julia Kim, and there she is with the man with the unfortunate name, Cardinal Sin, from the Philippines in 1992. So these are not just unimportant figures in Roman Catholicism. These are people blessed by the Pope, honored by the Pope with medals. These are important uh, figures. This woman over here is Catalina uh, from Bolivia. And uh, she lives in um, Bolivia, South America. And she suffers terribly when she gets the stigmata. Her feet swell up, her hands swell up. And she is then bedridden. Wherever she receives the stigmata, statues start bleeding and blood starts pouring down from any crucifix that hangs in the area. This woman was also from the United Kingdom. She also received automatic writing. She used to receive the stigmata. She became very, very ill and then she died as a consequence. This again is Christina Gallagher. There she has the marks of the crown of thorns. This woman over here is Sister Anna Ali of Nigeria. So currently, there's a stigmatist on every continent. That's very interesting. Every continent in the world today has a stigmatist in the Roman Catholic Church, something that has never been in Catholic history. This one over here to me is the worst one, Mary of Damascus. Uh, the statues over here start bleeding and some of them, most of them, drip oil. And they've analyzed the oil. It's pure olive oil. But this is the young girl that uh, receives the stigmata in this area. Her name is Mirna Nazur. And uh, she lives in Damascus. And she suffers terribly when she has the stigmata. I want you to look at this young girl. She's a very pretty young lady. There she is. That's what she looks like normally. And when she gets the stigmata... She starts bleeding from the forehead and then when, after a while she starts looking like that. Now, this is very impressive, but I have a question. If Jesus died once for all, for all our sins, is it necessary for anyone else to suffer the pains of the crucifixion in order to atone for the sins of the world? Yes or no? No, it's not biblical. So if it's not biblical... Who's doing this to this poor lady? Can only be Satan. I hate what he does. Why should these poor people be so deceived? Why should they suffer like this for nothing when the truth could set them free? You see, I'm not preaching this against Catholics. I was a Catholic myself. I wish every single Catholic in the world would listen to these lectures. 
I wish every single Catholic in the world could be set free from signs and wonders and apparitions and lies and deceitful, disgusting doctrines which lead to nothing other than death. Why should they be so deceived? She bleeds from the feet, she bleeds from the hands. Is that fair? Is that right? And the icons of oil, well, there are official analyses. It's the purest form of olive oil that there is. They cannot even extract it that pure if they have it otherwise done. This is another young girl, Staglara. She doesn't have the stigmata, but she goes into great agony and pure olive oil just pours out of her skin. It's very hard to explain, wouldn't you agree? And uh, that's the oil that comes out. It's also been analyzed. Crosses all over the place. People supposedly healed. Millions standing in queues for water. And then in 1996, CNN had a news flash that the Virgin Mary appeared in the front window of a building in Florida. And it was a bank. Amazingly enough, and there it is, a permanent picture of Mary. And these are the crowds adoring around this area. Now when it first appeared, Catholics started praying the rosary, and they started speaking in tongues. Anybody who walked by started speaking in tongues. And here is a, a young uh, woman being converted to Catholicism, and this bubble appeared above, which was the rosary, just appearing miraculously. Taken in 1998 in Georgia of myself and a recent convert named Jill from Taylorsville. She was converted to Catholicism, the grace of God, via the intervention of our Heavenly Mother. Uh, this picture was taken after a talk I gave in Atlanta. I was praying over her and her medals when a rosary in the shape of a heart appeared between us in the picture. So these are the Marian apparitions and the stigmata that are happening in the world whereby Catholicism gets credence as having the stamp of approval from heaven. This is a summary of all the Marian predictions. She says, Pope John Paul II will be the last before the final events. That's interesting. You know, the devil was a liar from the beginning, so I don't take any of the predictions too seriously. I wouldn't, uh, you know, bet my life on them. But surely, if the devil has put up so much hype and so much energy to deceive people, then some of these things are actually so planned that they will more or less work out. Sometimes he makes a mistake. The new pope will be eliminated by an Islamic convert bishop who declares himself pope. Well, we haven't seen that yet. I don't know whether it will happen or not. The new world order will come. There will be a chastisement. I think that might be trying to explain the plagues that will fall once he has done what he's done. True pope restored, church will reign, and the coming of Christ. Well, I believe there will be a death decree in there somewhere. So the doctrine is not biblical, it's all upside down. And Mary is to be the prophetess of the last times, the Immaculate Conception, the Mother of the Church, the New Eve, the Queen of Heaven, the Assumption, the Holy Rosary, ah, all of it, Redemptrix, Mediatrix, Advocate, everything that Jesus is supposed to be, she is. Rome does not change. Rome today is as conservative even more so than it has ever been. And you can check every doctrine in the Catholic Catechism and you will see it. The church, the pillar and bulwark of truth has received the solemn command of Christ from the apostles to announce the saving truth. To the church belongs the right always and everywhere to announce moral principles, including those pertaining to the social order and to making judgments on any human affairs to the extent that they're required by fundamental rights of human persons or the salvation of souls. The magisterium of the pastors and the moral matters is ordinarily exercised in the catechesis, in preaching, etc. From generation to generation, uh, the pastor's deposit of Christian moral teaching has been handed on a deposit composed of a characteristic body of rules, commandments, and virtues proceeding from faith in Christ. So, traditionally, 
the Decalogue sets out the principles of moral life valid for all men. Now let's get to the hub of this matter. Ever since, this is Article 2065 from the Catechism, ever since St. Augustine, who as we saw was a insider initiative, initiate, the Ten Commandments have occupied a predominant place in the catechesis of baptismal can candidates. Okay. The Catechism of the Church has often expounded Christian morality by following the order of the Ten Commandments. The division and numbering of the commandments has varied in the course of history. The present Catechism follows the division of commandments established by whom? St. Augustine. So we're not following the Bible, we're following an insider initiate. The world, it Assisi, gave itself to the Pope. Behold, the Slavic Pope is coming, a brother of the people. He already pours the world's balm into our breast, and the angel choir sweep his throne for him with flowers. Can you believe that? They came man of the year, and he appeared at Sinai, and he prayed at Sinai, and he said, the Ten Commandments are still binding. Mary, so-called, revealed to Father Gobi, my Pope John Paul II, I confirm to you, is the Pope of my secret, the Pope about whom I spoke to the children during the apparitions of Fatima, in other words. So in other words, this was the Pope that was to fulfill all the Fatima predictions, and the last one that was not known was that this was the Pope that would, be, uh, that would survive an attempted assassination. And then when he has finished his work, I will come from heaven and receive his sacrifice. Okay, now what is the remedy, says Mary, to the problem that the world is facing, all this chaos? She says, this is a place where we see many of the root causes of our problem. It is the commandment of keeping the Sabbath holy. Back to our question. In the Old Testament, not honoring this day was only one of several sins punishable by death. Although we are not living under law of the Old Testament, there's a widespread abuse of all throughout the Christian culture concerning the Sabbath. In the West, we have lost God through our affluence. In the East, God has been lost through communism and suffering. Both have lost sight of a Sabbath. Which Sabbath do you think that she's talking about? Well, let's ask her. God's intention for the Sabbath was a day of rest, honoring God through worship, conversation, teaching, and praise. Today, if anyone even bothers to go to church at all, Sunday will be an endless litany of recreation, television, athletic events, shopping, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on and on about what people do on that particular day. Now, Magikore and the Commandments. Dear children, today also I wish to tell you I am with you in these restless days in which Satan wishes to destroy everything. Remember in occultism you twist that round? Which I and my son Jesus are building up in a special way. He wishes to destroy your souls. He wishes to guide you as far away as possible from Christian life as well as from the commandments to which they, the church, is calling you so you may live them. Satan wishes to destroy everything which is holy in you and around you. Therefore, little children, pray, pray, pray in order to be able to comprehend all which God is giving through my coming. Who's coming? Mary's coming. Okay. So now the Seventh-day Adventist church says, keep the commandments of God, and the Catholic church, through its visionaries, is saying, keep the commandments of Rome. Is this right or not? Okay. And the Pope says, Make it clear, Sunday must not be work since it must be celebrated as the Lord's Day. Can you see that the Sabbath has become the issue of acknowledging the authority of God? Yes. So it's not just a question of a day. It's a question of authority. So at the right time, here comes a movement and says, keep the commandments of God and they lift up the Sabbath the Seventh-day Adventist Church. At the same time, Mary appears and says, Satan has been let loose on the planet and keep the Sabbath of the church. They're both preaching the same thing, just from two different perspectives. And it's your choice whether you want to choose 
this perspective, the only support you have for the doctrine, signs and wonders and apparitions and bleeding icons and suffering people, that's the support. Or the other one, thus says the Lord. That's the choice. That's the choice that the world has. So no wonder at this interfaith meeting that we've spoken about so much, it's the Christian fundamentalists that will be condemned and be declared dangerous extremists full of hate. Here is Pope John Paul II. Here he is in the Marian cave praying at one of the apparition sites. And this is fascinating. This is the Pope's plane, USTWA, with his light shining above it, which Rome says was the Shekinah glory. Okay. On July 13, 1986, our Blessed Mother explained another of her roles through Father Gobi. This is the moment for all to take refuge in me because I am the Ark of the New Covenant. At the time of Noah, immediately before the flood, those whom the Lord had destined to survive his terrible chastisement entered into the Ark. In these your times, I am inviting all my beloved children to enter into the Ark of the New Covenant which I have built in my Immaculate Heart for you that they may be assisted by me to carry the bloody burden of the great trial which preceded the coming of the day of the Lord. Do not look anywhere else. There is a happening today. There is happening today what happened in the days of the flood. Well, the other side teaches the same thing. It says, there is an ark of building. God is calling a people into a relationship with himself. You either come into the one ark that keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus or you climb into this ark. Which one is of God? John 14, 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose hand lands you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So that's our choice. Two ox. Which one are we going to choose? Choice is yours. Thank you.